louder than that. We've got to make it seem like there's a big crowd. Well, no, I might get in trouble for that. Never mind. We'll just leave it the way it was. And welcome to Lafayette Presbyterian Church on this, the Lord's Day, the second Sunday of Advent in the year of our Lord, 2020. We are glad that you are here, whether you are here or you in person or here down the street on Zoom or Facebook Live. We are glad that you are taking the time to worship with us on this day as we do what we know to do as the people of God to worship God in this time of social distancing and, uh, and indeed unusual days. Uh, a couple of very brief announcements. A reminder to our session that tomorrow at 6.30 we will be having our regular session meeting I think uh, Melanie has sent out financials uh, a week or so ago. Um, David has sent out minutes from the committee meetings, and so you should have all of those. And I will be sending out the agenda uh, sometime tomorrow. Uh, it's our typical normal agenda. Um, and if you have anything you want to see added to that, uh, you can send it to me, or we can pop it up in new business if we need to. Also, a reminder that we will have our fellowship time tonight at 6.30, and that invitation will be going out as well. We do have some new prayer concerns I thought I would let folks share with. I know that um, Richard and Ray have, I didn't bring my card up here with me, David? What's the, what's the David Cummings. David Cummings um, and his wife have been going through a number of health illnesses, heart surgeries, cancer diagnosis, and we would really need to keep those folks in our prayers in the coming days. Of course, prayers for all of our leaders as they continue to struggle to do what they know to do in this time of pandemic. Um, and then a prayer of thanksgiving on my family. By the time you see me in this pulpit next Sunday, good Lord willing, and we pass one more final, I will have a graduate of the Georgia Institute of Technology living in my home. If you are looking for a graduate of the Georgia Institute of Technology to be full-time employed in your household, please let me know. You can reach out at any time. Uh, no, we are excited. She's looking forward to grad school, waiting on some announcements that are behind with COVID, as well as people who aren't hiring right this second at Christmas, but we've got some good possibilities for the first year. So, proud dad moment here, if you don't mind. I'll ask our, the proud mother uh, to come forward and lead us in our call to worship. I'll also tell you when the time comes, the lighting of the Advent candle uh, is being done virtually. They came in early, and we by Linda um, and Patrice, Anne. Anne, I'm calling her her daughter already, uh, Linda and Anne, um, who are coming in, and I was going to say, I hope Patrice is watching, because uh, she's going to be Facebook famous uh, as we add this there for those in attendance in a little while. Um, so I invite Laura now to lead us in the call to worship. Please join me in the response to all the worship now printed in your bulletin. John the Baptist said, prepare the way. So, family of faith, how do we prepare our minds for worship? We, we silence the inner critic. We let it go of what we lost. We make space for God to speak. How do we prepare our hearts for worship? We bless all emotions. We feel we open ourselves up to be moved. How do we prepare our bodies for worship? We take in the sunlight and the feel of this space. We breathe in God's mercy. We exhale God's love. How do we prepare our souls for worship? We bring our full selves into this space. We wear our hearts on our sleeves. We do trust that even now, God is here. Family of faith, what we practice in worship 
we must live out in our daily lives. So prepare the way. Let us worship the Holy God. I dream of the first pitch of opening season. I dream of a laundry day where each sock finds its mate. I dream of the family home for the holidays. I dream of good books and homemade meals. I dream of sunset drives with the windows down. These are beautiful dreams, but I also have urgent dreams. I dream of conversation across party lines. I dream of more bridges and less walls. I dream of more laughter and less fear. I dream of more listening and less tears. I dream of, but most of all, I dream of peace like a river. Today, we light the candle of peace. May it remind us that there is another way. Amen.
God of peace, we must admit there are a million things on our minds. We'd like to be as focused as John the Baptist, preparing the way, gathering the crowd, spreading the word of your arrival. Maybe then we'd know peace. However, more often than not, we are
Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. choking me down around my neck, or it's leaning off the back and shooting at the person behind me, or hanging off an ear in a, a very awkward manner. I guess that's the peace and grace I have. Our New Testament lesson comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, the first eight verses. Hear now the good news. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and the people from the whole Judea countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate honey and locusts. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Good gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who art our strength and our redeemer in Christ. Amen. So it, it, it's the second week of Advent. We, we, we've got two candles lit over there. And, and, and the second week of Advent, the lectionary, the lectionary takes us to the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. I need to tell you, I, I enjoy reading God, Mark's gospel. I, I always have. When I was a child or, or a young person, they said you had to pick a, a gospel to read in, in order to join the church. You, you remember that for confirmation? I, I chose Mark. It was the shortest. It's also the most action-packed. I, I think that's a guy thing, the shortest and the most action-packed. Now, now, Mark is the Cliff Notes version. I, I, I don't want you to get me wrong, but, but it does read more of a story, especially when you compare it with the other Gospels, especially the Gospel of, of John. You see, John, John's less of a story and, and more of a, a treatise and, 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 and an explanation and, and a sharing of theology. In, in fact, John says this is his Gospels very purpose. Mark, however, says it very clear. He is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's given an account, an account of the life of Jesus. Now, now that doesn't mean it doesn't include theology. You, you can't talk about Jesus and not have some theology. But Mark, Mark, less than any of the others, 
doesn't focus on Jesus' sayings as much. In fact, he's left out large portions of the discourse, focusing more on the telling of the story that Jesus Christ is the long-awaited Messiah. Some scholars say that it marks purpose is to share a, a secret, that the messianic secret that Jesus of Nazareth is Lord. And then, after, after he reveals it, Mark turns his focus to the kingdom of God through discipleship. Though, though these scholars will say it, it's far less of, of an advanced telling of the kingdom of God than, say, Matthew or Luke. I think it's also critical to note that, that Mark doesn't conceal any of the failures of the disciples. More than any other, he shows how those disciples mess up again and again. How they have a hard time understanding the teachings of Jesus and the things he's doing here on earth. And Mark, Mark is very quick to show the shortcomings of one of those disciples in particular, Peter. Of course, it makes sense. Because most scholars believe that, that much of what Mark is writing is actually Peter's words. That they were good friends, that they spent time together. Mark was kind of like his, his autobiographer speechwriter. You know, he, he just said on all the things that, that Peter has told him. They have plenty of time to do that, but because Mark, Mark and Peter were in Rome when this was written. And they were doing one of three things while they were in Rome. They were either, either under house arrest, in jail, or hiding from the earth. So they had time to get some things written down. I share this background with you to help you understand that, that most of this gospel is really a first-hand account of Jesus and the disciples. And thus it begins with the disciples being called. There is not a word in Mark about the birth of Jesus. Instead, it starts with this unusual man crying out in the wilderness. And in the process, making a lot of people, including me, rather uncomfortable. Why so well, 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 let's first start with his appearance. I, I, I know, I know we're not supposed to talk about how people look, but, but the Bible tells us. So I think I can mention it, right? It, it, it says John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. Camel's hair, I bet that itched. I mean, the old saying is that, that clothes make the man. You've heard that, right? Clothes make the man. Then what this day John seen is, is what we call a wee bit eccentric. A -a Actually, he's only eccentric if he's really, really wealthy. After that, you might say he's just a tad bit crazy. Additionally, additionally, his craziness goes a little further. It says he comes out of the wilderness. I, I, I'm okay with that. You get to know that. But then it says he ate locusts and wild honey. Friends, no one in their right mind, I think, has a diet of simply locusts and wild honey. I have yet to have my children when I say, what y'all want for dinner tonight? Oh, we'd like some locusts and wild honey, please. All kidding aside, John the Baptist got your attention even if you only heard him and never saw him. He spoke his words that they would have grabbed a hold of you for sure. Listen again to what the text it says, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming the baptism of repentance 
for the forgiveness of sins. People from the countryside, even Jerusalem, were going out to him and were being baptized in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. John proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Remember I said Mark didn't include all the dialogue? Well, Mark doesn't include everything that John says. Other writers give us a far greater account of the words that, that, that John explained, and they were words of fire and brimstone. It seems he often began his sermons by calling the congregation a bunch of snakes. Imagine with me for a moment. Just think of starting my sermon like this. You are demon. Amen. You sons of snakes, you belly call them serpents. And they go on for about 25 minutes. Just like, I will not be in this pulpit next week because my wife would have me in the nut house somewhere get some counseling. That's if she let me ride back in the car with her. And yet, this is the man, this is the man sent by God to fulfill the prophet's words. Words of the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending a messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now I think we have to remember times were different back then. Today, today if I want to get you guys a message, it, it, it's pretty simple. I, I can pull out my phone with a few clicks on it I, I, and, and a spin. I believe I can talk to it, though it doesn't always understand me. I can talk to it, it'll send a message to you. you you'll get it instantly almost. I can send you pictures and videos and, and links to my Christmas list. But, but in the time of John, John didn't have access to such stuff. Now fortunately for him, unlike us, he didn't have to worry about social media or branding or whether or not Zoom or Google Handout, Hangouts or, or Microsoft Teams or Facebook Live were the best options for him. He got his message out the old-fashioned way. Word of mouth. Maybe a few letters you could write and send the head up, but it was mostly word of mouth. But there was very little written in that time. He, even the Hebrew nation, even the people of the book, the people of the Torah, had few scripts, and, and there were scrolls and all that. But anyway, you, you, you get my point. So part of me says that, that John dressed the way he did because he needed a hook. Something to make you say, i got to go see that. You, you know, just like you, you would go to the carnival as a child to, to see the man who would breathe fire like a dragon. But there was this strange man coming out of the wilderness who spoke words and looked a little bit like a monster, even if it wasn't a dragon. It, it was good enough to get people even from the big city of Jerusalem to come here. Yeah, I know people have gotten tied up in, in why John dressed the way he dressed and, and some of those things. And we, we could get into that. But it also could simply have been his way of getting people to show up so that they might hear the words he needed to say. Now, don't get me get any ideas. I will not, when we come back face to face, show up here in Camel's hair. It makes me a little uncomfortable. I already told you that. But I do think we need to hear his words and consider his message. And I think it's especially important to do so 
on this second Sunday of Advent, a Sunday when we were invited to look, to look at peace. Because peace doesn't seem to fit John the Baptist, does it? It seems to be a contradiction. If anything, John seems to be a radical revolutionary and not a pacifist. He does it again and again. He finally gets himself beheaded. I mean, when we think of peace, especially at Christmas, don't we think of, of sitting in front of the fire with the, the snow coming down softly in the background, a cup of hot chocolate in our hands, the tree lit, nobody, nobody arguing about how the tree got up, it, it was just went up in an amazing thing. All the lights worked. Those beautiful, beautiful Christmas card scenes. Of course, if it's not Christmas, I know what we think about when we really think about peace, right? It, it, it starts with a VW micro bus, doesn't it? Had, had, had a lot of tie-dye. Got to have some tie-dye. Campfires and guitar players and, and a lot of kumbaya. A few flowers in the hair, that 1960s utopia. But of course, of course, that's not what peace really is. Neither of those images are. I think perhaps we want that to be what peace is, because it leaves us safe. It leaves us safe to say that's never going to happen, and therefore we don't have to do anything to work. Jimmy Carter calls us out on that. He often says that we need to go about waging peace. Friends, the truth is that peace is not a static activity. It requires us to be involved. Pope Paul VI said, if you want peace, work for justice. John Paul II went further when he stated, to reach peace, teach peace. You see, I think part of the message of John the Baptist was that he was in a, a great line, a great line of prophets who came both prior to the Lord and who are still coming today. And they say things, and they say them not so nicely sometimes. They say, if you want a world at peace, you have to have a world that is just. And if there is no justice, there cannot be peace. Cries have gone out from protests. No justice. No peace. It's a rallying cry. It's a rallying cry that has gone across the centuries. It, it, it includes our very own revolutionary founders. When they cried out to King George, no justice, no representation for our taxation, then there will be no peace. It wasn't a threat, it was simply a statement of fact. No justice, no peace. John is telling people that until we create a society that is just, we won't experience peace. And until we're willing to say in our own lives that we need God to help reconcile us, to bring about a sense of justice and mercy in all that we do, then we will never experience peace in our own souls. And too often, too often we fight against this, don't we? We fight against God's plan for us. We're, we're better off wanting to do our own thing. I, I, I know I am. You, you, you know, we, we strive to, to benefit ourselves. And, and if it happens to help somebody else uh, along the way, e even more the good. We, we hear God's will for us, but, but, but we want to push it aside. Push it aside, not, not only for us, but our, our family, our community, our, our, our world. It, it's a lot easier that way. And then we wonder why we 
or struggle with peace in our own lives. You see, we tend to worry little for justice and more for our own desires. We hear, create a straight path. But we forever this all around with rocks and boulders. A smooth path is more what we're after. E even if it means leaving people on the roadside or, or, or falling over them to get to our objective. And yet, yet that Advent candle over there asks us to dream, to dream of peace here in this season. But know that the Prince of Peace has come to the earth for humanity. John the Baptist, John the Baptist, and in all of his eccentric activities, calls people into a journey into a journey of repentance and transformation so that they might experience peace. Similarly, we are called to prepare a way for God's message of love and liberation to be heard and received. You see, those dreams make a way for peace. They make a way for righteousness and for faithfulness spring from the ground. Our song proclaims it so beautifully. Love and faithfulness be righteousness and peace. Embrace each other with a kiss. But for that to happen, for that to happen, we have to go through that process of repentance. We must admit how often we miss of course, that idea of missing the mark, that, that sentiment comes from Judaism, the, the religion of Jesus. Judaism taught that sin was a part of everyone's life. And since there, since there is no perfect man, and thus we all commit evil. In fact, the Hebrew word for sin literally means to miss the mark. Now, I got a little story on myself. When I was a child, my dad sent me several summers to Elberton, Georgia to stay with my grandmother. Because I probably would have driven her absolutely slap dab crazy if I was with her all day. They also sent me to Camp Harmony just outside of Elberton, Georgia. It, it was an old school camp. It was run by one of my father's mentors, a, a childhood surrogate father who, who was there after my dad's father died, uh, a man who, who would dwarf me by the name of BBEs. BB, in fact, played football at the University of Georgia. That makes a few of me smile. And BB was an all-American there. In, in fact, he, he, was, he was a tough tough young man. He broke his back playing a football game, but finished playing the game before he told the trainer about it. Now I was a city boy, a suburban city boy come to country. Think I had an accent? Just wait. And I had never been outdoorsy. Wasn't sure what this outhouse thing was all about. And I struggled with most of the activities. Very few of them had anything to do with video games. But there was one I was especially mad at. Archery. <laughs> I was terrible at it. I mean, the struggle was real. No one, I noticed, no one stood anywhere near the target when they gave me the bow and arrow. People scattered. Frankly, folks, the safest place to have been would to have been in front of the target because I never once hit it. In all of my years, I never once got close. <laughs> Birds took off from other counties in fear, but the target was the safe place. I guess I remember that when I was studying for this, for this sermon. It seems when folks practice the time of Jesus, that they didn't order 
targets, like, like we do and for now. You know, you get it in two days, free shipping for Amazon.com. It's not on my Christmas list. No, they would put up targets or, or, or shoot at items out there, often trees. If you miss the mark, you miss the tree. Now, perhaps I'm stretching it a bit here. But God so often, both in Genesis and in Revelation, is, is called the tree of life. And I think when we miss the target, our sin is the fact that we have been connected with the tree of life, with God. You see, if I understand the text, it's actually turning away from God's life-giving love and turning towards self-will and independence and alienation. Friends, perfection is not a mark that we should strive towards. It's not the mark we need. Instead, the mark we're shooting for is union with and trust in God. God's goodness. Being and walking with God, that's the mark we're trying to reach. And when we do that, we'll find that we will have a willingness to seek justice, a desire for mercy. We will continue to walk with our Lord. Choosing to dream of a world that experiences peace because we advocate and work for a just life and a just world. That's the mark we should seek. Dr. Marshall Riggs, who's a professor at Columbia Seminary, has said that at Advent, we are to dream like Mary and Joseph, surely their son. She says, and I quote, dreamers acknowledge the world is violent, but they have a vision of a society of just peace. They proclaim no justice, no peace. Friends, as, as we have lit today's candle, and as we will come to the table, we remember that Jesus came into the world to be the priest to weary souls. And oh, how my soul is sometimes weary. But as Christ's followers of those who have been baptized by both the water and the Holy Spirit, we are to be new masters, proclaiming justice and peace. And we are to do it every day that we live. It's not a one-time thing. So we must proclaim as our Lord's messengers that, that what we see isn't all there is. It isn't all that there should be. It isn't all that there will be. The kingdom of God is at hand. We must face the troubles of our world receptively and perceptively and attentively as we proclaim the Lord has come. And he's come and he has overcome evil, even death itself. And because of this love, because of his promise of justice and mercy and peace, even in this 2020, the year of pandemic, we can proclaim with the faithful chorus of those before us that this is an advent of peace and joy. Joy to the world. For we know that because of Christ, we will indeed overcome someday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we believe. Help our belief in Christ. Amen. As we can
continue in worship. Let us confess that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover on page 14 of your hymnal. Let us stand and confess that which we believe. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life lasting. Amen. You may be seated. My friends, God has indeed blessed us richly. Let us return unto God a portion of those blessings through the presentation of our tithes and our offerings. A reminder of all the many ways you can give through both online and mail and other opportunities. Our offertory hymn is down by the Jordan. It is to the familiar tune of Praise Ye, Praise Ye the Lord, and it is found with the words printed in your worship materials this day.
We know that that which we return to you is only a small portion of the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we ask that these blessings be taken and used and multiplied for the growing of your kingdom in this world. Oh God, take these gifts, but more importantly, take our lives that they too might be used for the building of your kingdom, a kingdom where justice and mercy and peace and love reign forever. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. We come now to a time of communion. Both for those within the sanctuary, we've seen the other cues, and they have been prepared and left there, and also a time for communion virtually, asking Laura and Sydney to assist. Not a presbyterian your table is the table of our Lord. So wherever you are, whether you're in this room or across the street or across the globe, you are invited for our Lord bids you come. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord had invited his disciples to come to the table, sat and shared a meal with them, and then took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and said, Come now to the time of prayer for the people. Let us pray. O oh God, on the second Sunday of Advent, we ponder our human bereavement, recognizing how 
how often we find ourselves overwhelmed by circumstances, stuck in ditches of various sorts, or given the aimless meandering on paths that lead nowhere, or buried under by seemingly insurmountable choices and obstacles. And yet you have promised to lift every valley, straighten the crooked path, and level the mountains in order to come to us and lead us home. We hear your promises, O oh God. Empower us by your Spirit to see the way you have set before us. Empower us as a community of faith to accompany one another on the journey. Help us to listen to each other with compassion when we feel fearful or angry or lost. And help us to recognize your tender love that is ever before us. Help us to believe the good news of the gospel that we are not left to our own devices. You have not left us in the ditch or aimlessly wandering in exile. You have come close in the incarnate Christ, one with a human face, who has left a footprint for us to follow. We pray for the world of nations, including our own, as we continue to grapple with the relentless pandemic. We pray especially for the vulnerable among us, for the medical professionals and staff, for essential workers, for parents for school-aged children, for the elderly and for the existing health conditions. Oh God, help us to live responsibly in ways that protect the well-being of others. We pray for all who are grieving the loss of loved ones during these difficult days. We pray that you would grant wisdom to the leadership of our local communities, our cities, our states, and our country, that they might discern a path forward in these perilous times. Indeed, Grant all of us wisdom and courage for the living of these days. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into Friends, as you leave this place, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and indeed give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I will